Welcome everybody. It's a very chilly night outside, but hopefully this is a warm and interesting place to be. And uh, tonight we're having a very special session that brings together a series of stories. Um, stories that relate to cancer experiences, stories that build resilience. And, um, and I think I should probably start with a bit of a story. I recently went to an international uh, cancer conference and uh, only in preparation of this session I sort of reflected on the fact that as I think about what was discussed at the conference, I actually remember that there were lots of graphs and lots of figures and lots of diagrams and lots of statistics, but I actually don't remember them very well. I've got them written down somewhere and there are files put away and I can of course refer to them and pull out the figures when required. But I do remember that there was the one session where people told stories, stories of their experience. And I remember the story quite vividly in quite, quite, a, quite a significant sort of detail, a story of a person who was describing her particular cancer treatment and how serendipity intervened and her course of her illness changed dramatically because somebody got stuck in the snow in Minnesota and missed a plane. And, uh, and the story had a very happy ending. And it's, sort of, it's quite fitting for me to reflect that that's the story that stays with me and it will probably stay with me for many, many years. So I think that there is something to be said for the story. And that person who was, who was uh, telling what happened to her made a comment and said, she comes from a um, advertising background and she says, in advertising you say, uh, if you want to blind somebody with silence, science, you give them statistics, but if you really want to move an issue, you tell the story. So I hope that tonight you'll be moved by uh, the stories that you hear and that it would allow us to move some of the issues that I think very, are very important in, uh, in the area of care of cancer. So we've got three speakers today and I am very well supported by my very able co-chair, Julie Marker. Julie, do you want to come up here? And um, we're going to get the, the show started. So, Julie. Well, it's with absolute pleasure that I'm able to introduce our first speaker for this evening, Marie Ennis O'Connor, who is a lovely Irish lady. She's visiting here just for six months in Adelaide, nearing the end of her stay, but she's become an honorary member of Cancer Voices while she's been here and has participated in a number of, of activities, including uh, quite a few down here at Flinders as well. So I'll just tell you a little bit about Marie, and um, I'm sure she's going to tell us some stories that will stay with you. <laughs> <laughs> Marie is a cancer survivor. She's a social media consultant and a healthcare writer with a passionate interest in the role of social media in healthcare. She's regularly invited to speak at international conferences on, on the e-patient movement. In 2012, Marie co-founded Europe's first breast cancer social media chat and is a founding member of the Health2 Dublin and part that is part of the Health2 international movement. Marie's also a board member of Europa Donna, that's the Irish cancer breast cancer um, campaign and that's one of 46 Europa Donna countries in, in Europe. Um, Marie writes about her experience as a cancer survivor on a blog and that blog is called Journeying Beyond Breast Cancer. Uh, as we all know Marie's going to address how storytelling can help us articulate and understand ourselves and the world around us and how this can impact on the cancer journey. So without further ado I'm sure you just want to hear Marie. Oh. Thanks, Julie. I'm going to move around a lot, so hopefully I won't be moving too far away from this. So um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here this evening, and I'd like to first of all thank um, Bogda and thank Julie for the invitation to come here and talk about a topic that anybody who knows me knows that I am endlessly fascinated in this topic, and I hope that by the end of my talk that you will find um, something of interest too. 
So um, I don't need to introduce myself, as Julie has introduced the only uh, introduced me so nicely. The only thing is that for those of you who maybe tweet, I'm at JBBC. Um, and this is the thing that they, we say now at conferences. We start to put up our Twitter handles more at conferences so that we can involve social media and we can involve online audiences more in, um, in conferences and in events. So if you're wondering what this um, little bit kind of strange looking images that I have up on the screen, it's a sculpture that's called the Storyteller. And it can be found in the lobby of the International Storytelling Center in Jonesboro in Tennessee in the USA. And the idea is that the storyteller holds the world in his or her hands. And for me, that's a very fitting metaphor for what I want to talk to you about. So, just to give you an idea of the way that this talk will go, I've divided the talk into four different parts, but if I do it right, by the end of the talk, the whole four parts will come together and they'll form a whole a story. In the first part, I'm going to set the scene. So I'm going to be talking about why do stories matter so much to us as humans? In the second part of the talk, I'm going to look at a particular type of story called the illness narrative. And in part three, I'm going to talk about how do we tell our stories in an age of YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and, and blogs. And for the final part, I'm going to introduce the narrative medicine aspect, which concerns how we use stories to move beyond the biomedical model of disease to a more holistic patient-centered model. Okay, let's start with setting the scene. Why do stories matter so much to us? Well, we tell stories every day. We tell stories at work, we tell stories over morning tea, we tell stories at parties, at dinner. And if you come home in the evening, you may be asked, so how was your day, dear? And if you do, if you are asked this, it's an opportunity for you to reflect on the events of your day and for, <laughs> for you to reflect on the events of your day and to share what's happened in the day since you were last with your loved ones. So stories then are a form of sharing. They create a social fabric around which we weave a web of meaning. From the earliest of times, storytelling has existed universally across cultures. It's been one of the most important tools that we use to inspire, to empower, to teach, and to comfort. In the sharing of stories, we pass on the wisdom and the values of previous generations, and the culture and the history of our ancestors. Our human condition draws us naturally to listen, as our ancestors did, gathering metaphorically around the campfire to listen to stories. But it goes even deeper than this. Recent breakthroughs in neuroscience reveal that your brain is actually hardwired to respond to story. Your brain, as Bogda pointed out, your brain on story is different than your brain when it's receiving any other form of information, including straight facts and data. And I really like this quote from a writer called Lisa Krohn. And she writes that story, as it turns out, was crucial to our evolution more so than opposable thumbs. Opposable thumbs let us hang on, but story told us what to hang on to. So how does storytelling affect the brain? Let me see if I can get started. Yes. So let's begin with the thing called neural coupling. A story activates parts in the brain that allows the listener to turn the story into their own ideas and experience. And then the brain releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine when it experiences an emotionally charged event, making it easier to remember and with greater accuracy. Listeners also experience similar brain activity to the storyteller which is when we mirror what the storyteller is telling us. And storytelling activates um, two language areas in the brain, Broca's and Wernicke's, and it can engage additional cortex activity, including the motor and the sensory and the frontal. Now, if I can get this to work, I want to illustrate by showing you a short snippet from a video. This is research done by an American neuroeconomist called Paul Zak. And he showed that by reading simple humanistic stories, what's in our bloodstreams streams actually changes. So just bear with me for a moment. I want to tell you a story about a little boy named Ben. Ben is two and a half years old and Ben has brain cancer. And Ben's really happy. He's happy because he's been through two rounds of chemo and radiation, and he feels good for once. He doesn't feel yucky, and his father's enjoying seeing Ben's happiness. But as the father tells the story 
of Ben and his cancer, the father's voice begins to break. And he says, you know, it's very difficult to play with Ben because Ben thinks everything is wonderful, but I know something that Ben doesn't, that Ben's dying. And he talks about how difficult it is to play with Ben, knowing that in three or six months, Ben will be dead. And yet Ben is so happy, he's so beautiful. And so the father tries as hard as he can to enjoy Ben, to be joyful around Ben. But then he says in the middle of this short story that it's an amazing thing to know how little time one has left. And as he says that statement, he has merged himself with his son. It's as if the father himself is dying. So in my laboratory, we've studied this story extensively. And what we found is that two primary emotions were elicited. One is distress and the other is empathy. At the same time, when we asked people what they felt after the story was over, we really couldn't get very clear answers. So we began doing other studies on this story. So we took blood before and after, and we found that the brain produced two interesting chemicals. One is called cortisol, which focuses our attention on something important. So cortisol correlated with our sense of distress. So the more distress you felt, the more cortisol you released, and the more you paid attention to that stimulus. The second chemical release is called oxytocin, which is associated with care and connection and empathy. And oxytocin was correlated with people's sense of empathy. And the more oxytocin they released, the more empathic they felt towards Ben and his father. All I need to show of that for now, just to illustrate the point, and it doesn't matter how many times I watch that video, I still feel myself kind of tearing up when I watch it. It's very, very, very powerful. Um, if anybody's interested, <laughs> sorry, <Mom. laughs> I have Monique in tears. If anybody's interested in watching that or learning more about it, it's on YouTube and, and you can um, check with Julia or myself and I can give you the, the link to it. <clears throat> so I want to look now at the illness narrative. And I want to begin with a quote, and this time it's a quote from a book by um, an author called Anatole Broyard. And it's a quote from his book, Intoxicated by My Illness, which he wrote um, a few weeks before he died from um, prostate cancer. And the quote is, Story, stories are antibodies against illness and pain. So I want to explore in the next few slides how this can be. So what do I mean by the illness narrative? Well, look at it this way. Life is made up of experiences which are shaped through the stories we tell of them. Think of a narrative then like a thread that weaves the events of our lives together, forming a story. And again, another quote, this time from an author called Sharon Bray. And a decade or so, um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She's an author, and since then, she's specialized in um, writing workshops with cancer patients. And she believes that when we weave together our stories, we weave ourselves back together at the same time. So it's through stories that we articulate and we understand ourselves and the world around us. The stories we have about our lives are created through linking certain events together in a particular sequence across a time period and finding a way of explaining or making sense of them. This meaning then forms the plot of our story. Now the conventional expectation of a narrative involving a past leading into a present or is leading into the present, yes, which foretells foreseeable future is profoundly disrupted by the experience of cancer. So in order to regain a coherent sense of self, we must interpret our cancer experiences. And when we tell our stories, we find a new context, we find new meaning, and we find fresh perspective. Stories provide a way of literally making sense of what is happening. In fact, Stories are so important that it led to this quote by the African-American poet and writer and activist Maya Angelou, who um, just died recently, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Arthur Frank is a sociologist, and he was one of the first to develop this concept of the illness narrative in his influential book, The Wounded Storyteller. And he used his own cancer experience as inspiration. In his book, he describes life as a journey and serious illness as a loss of the destination and the map that had previously guided the ill person's life. He writes that ill people learn by hearing themselves tell their stories, absorbing others' reactions, and experiencing their stories being shared. This is a pivotal point, so if you just bear this in mind as I go through this section of the talk. 
Frank defined three types of illness narratives, seeing them as the framework or the plot line that the ill person uses first to understand and then to explain his or her illness. The first of these he called the restitution narrative. The illness in this is seen as transitory. It's all about the body returning to its former image of itself before illness. The second narrative is, as the name suggests, a far more chaotic narrative. In this, the storyteller often feels that life will never get better and no one is in control. And finally, the quest narrative. Illness, in this case, is the occasion of a journey that becomes a quest, that there's something to be learned. Frank's book appeared in 1995, which is a decade or so before illness blogs became mainstream. And I want to return to this concept in the next part of my um, talk to see how this framework fits a model of how we tell our stories in a digital age. This is Tim Berners-Lee. He is the inventor of the wonderful World Wide Web. And this year, you may know, the internet is 25 years old. So somebody asked him what he thought was the most surprising thing about the internet in the past 25 years. So he thought about it. And he gave this answer, kittens. So, with respect, I disagree. I think that the most surprising thing is how easy we come together in communities, how easy we can tell our story, how easy we can find somebody who understands how we feel. Personal narratives shared through social media are an area of rapid development in communication among cancer survivors. A couple of days ago, I did a search on YouTube just to see how many cancer stories have been uploaded in the last month. And you can see the results there, 2,500. That's a lot of stories. But even more popular is the type of illness narrative that's told through blogs, the personal blogs. And it's an example of my blog here telling my story, Journeying Beyond Breast Cancer. These virtual diaries are not only a channel for the writer's thoughts and feelings, but they can also provide a forum for um, ongoing discussion among readers, which can be um, rich, there's rich information there too. In these blogs, you'll find grace, you'll find humour, you will find persistence and courage in the face of fear, grief, anger, loss, pain and fatigue. It makes you appreciate the strength of the human spirit in the fragility of the flesh, in the face of the fragility of the flesh. Now, most blogs start around the time of diagnosis or treatment in the same way that you might keep a diary. So you would write about your feelings around being diagnosed with cancer. You can chart the ups and downs of treatment. My blog was a little bit different in that I didn't actually start blogging until after my treatment had ended. And this is because it was only when the treatment ended and the full impact of what had happened really hit me that I felt really lost. You know, there's an expectation that when you walk out of the hospital on that final day of treatment, your cancer story is over, case closed, but we know this is not the case. It is not case closed. In many ways, your story, your story of healing is only just beginning. I struggled for a long time with the conflicting emotions that I know many cancer survivors feel, and for me it's summed up in this quote, end of chemo, end of being held in community. I am on my own. I am lost to wash. I know I look like a person, but I am not. So for me, I needed to find a new way of being in the world post-cancer. I needed to integrate the cancer experience before I could move on with my life. And again, for me, I found this through the community that I built through my blog and from writing. But there's many reasons why cancer survivors are turning to blogs to tell their stories. This slide might look familiar to some people. <laughs> Last year, I presented some of my own research here at the inaugural um, FCIC Survivorship Conference, and I presented it on the blogging motivations of a cohort of breast cancer survivors and what healthcare professionals and researchers could learn from this blog. And in the course of my research, I asked the question, um, what are some of the main psychological or social benefits you get from writing and or reading breast cancer blogs? And here's a sample of some of the survey, here's a survey sample, some of the responses I got. I love seeing how supportive the community is and being able to offer my support. It's so wonderful to realise we're not alone. So we have that feeling of being not just supported by the community, but also it's important to feel like you can also be supportive yourself. Writing helps me organize my thoughts and feelings. It helps me process and cope with my cancer journey. So there we have the meaning making, the sense making. And friendship, I've made some very meaningful friendships through blogging. 
And finally, feeling validated. It's like when you read a good book and say, yes, that's exactly what that's like. That humanity, that affirming, that recognition. Cancer blogs typically encompass periods of discovery and diagnosis, treatment, remission with return to daily activities, and for some, recurrence and terminal illness. Gradually, many bloggers cease to blog, it's fulfilled their function, but for some of us, we continue to blog months and even years after our treatment has ended. So I ask the question, what motivates us to keep on blogging even as we move further away from the cancer experience? And here are some of the um, responses that I got. So the respondents pointed again to this feeling, to th this feeling of needing to be connected and to be part of a community. And they pointed to the fact that they were still healing emotionally, because as we know, this takes time. Some bloggers were developing their blogs in a new direction. So they were providing downloadable resources and they were providing contact, content that other cancer survivors could gain something from. And finally, we know that even if cancer treatment ends, life's challenges don't end. So one person responded that, I find that my blogging helps me heal from other adverse life events. Many of my readers have gone through crises other than cancer and are a great support to me. So that kind of speaks as well to the universality of our experience. Okay, so back to Frank's three narratives again. I'm going to show in the next few slides some blogs. These are blogs that I read regularly, and I'm going to show you how they fit each of these narratives. The first of these is the restitution narrative, and this is the most familiar and socially condoned type of illness narrative. A restitution narrative sometimes tells the story of a patient being restored miraculously to good health due to the marvels of modern medicine. This blog is um, from a blogging, uh, an online friend of mine called Tammy Bomer. Tammy has metastatic breast cancer. She's doing very well at the moment, and she calls herself, as you know, an American does, she's a miracle survivor. So on her blog, she shares her story, and she shares it to give hope to other people, and she also showcases other miracle survivors. Another example here is Florence's blog. Florence uh, points to the basic plot of the restitution narrative as being cyclical. So that's the idea of bringing the story back full circle. And Florence set out to find 100 perks of having cancer. Now, I think that's probably a stretch for many of us who can't even find one maybe on a, on a bad day. But it's an example of how this is what made, this is what worked for Florence. Florence found her 100 perks of cancer in, in that way she found meaning. So a common theme in these narratives is the patient as the hero, the patient as the plucky, inspiring fighter. And for some people, such a narrative is helpful, but for other people, being shoehorned into that narrative at a time when you are really struggling to keep things together is just a step too far. So maybe you would prefer the chaos narrative. The chaos narrative is very different. It describes the experience of having a disease with no cure. The patient goes in a zigzag storyline, one that progresses from bad to worse and back to bad before getting worse again. And in the next slide, there's a powerful description of how the chaos narrative manifests. This illness narrative feels like being in a kayak in a class five rapid. While you're going through the rapids, time and place shift so rapidly, up and down, right and left transpose so often that one truly feels inside a vortex, the way out of which is entirely unknown in any one moment. Here's an example. Often these narratives describe, as this blog, Telling Knots does, a sense of hopelessness, despair, pain, and loneliness. And another example here in a blog by a blogger who calls herself the sarcastic boob. And she's writing here about the progression of her cancer. So it can be very difficult for most people to bear witness to these stories. It's natural for people to long for a restitution narrative where people return to the way that they were. And most people tend to reply, re respond with either cliches, you know, chin up and all of those cliches, or just silence. But the more that these stories are told, and the more that we can bear empathic witness to them, the more it helps others in similar situations feel less alone. And finally, the quest narrative. And in the quest narrative, you, you review your journey over time. You start to see all the threads weaving your stories together. And as you revisit your experience, you're often able to draw more meaning from them. Cancer is seen as part of a larger life story. 
and I use my own blog as an example here because long before I even knew there was such a thing called the um, quest narrative, I was on a quest narrative by calling my blog a journey and by knowing that I was using my blog to try to make sense of the experience. So we know that cancer is not one disease and in the same way our experience is not just one story. And what I think with blogging is that we have an opportunity to witness the diversity of those stories through reading the narratives contained in the blogs. And for me, this is expressed so well in these words from blogger Michelle Weldon. Before cancer arrived unannounced and uninvited, like a stealth bomber, I felt brainwashed, picturing the diagnosis would yield tattoos of pink ribbons, car magnets, strawberry cupcakes delivered daily to my door. From the spectator sidelines of cancer before the diagnosis, it all looked one dimensional. Now, this is not a criticism of anyone who finds, um, who finds strength and comfort in the pink ribbon culture. I've even been wearing one here myself. But it is a call to broaden the discussion, to embrace the diversity of illness narratives. As Michelle says, when I arrived on this side of cancer, I was able to see a true picture, one that is clear and unclouded, a broader, richer landscape of many colours. So when a blogging community works as it should, it's a place where you can tell your story, even if, or perhaps especially if, it doesn't fit a conventional narrative. And as more stories are told, a community of storytellers becomes enriched and empowered by the diversity of the narratives being shared. And community is crucial to this. For narratives to truly flourish, there must be a community to hear the stories. Storytelling is a relational activity that gathers others to listen and to empathise. In the digital age, we have an opportunity to come together in online communities, finding what poet Mary Oliver calls your place in the family of things. And in, this, in these communities, we have the opportunity to co-create meaning through building a shared narrative that empowers the entire community. And we come to the final part of my talk, narrative medicine. This is Dr. Rita Sharon. She's a medical doctor who was the first to use the phrase narrative medicine in 2000 defining it as the ability to acknowledge, to absorb, to interpret, and to act on the story and plights of others. The exploration of illness narratives provides valuable insight into patients' experiential account of illness, and it encourages professionals to look beyond the biomedical model of disease. To quote Dr. Sharon again, by bridging the divides that separate physicians from patients, themselves, colleagues, and society, narrative medicine offers fresh opportunities for respectful, empathic, and nourishing medical care. And when I asked my, my blogging respondents, what do you think healthcare professionals can learn from reading patient blogs? They replied, they can learn a great deal about the reality of living with cancer, recovery, side effects of treatment, long-term issues, the financial and emotional toll that cancer takes. They can learn about the diversity of patient experience. Perhaps it might highlight the patient-provider communication gap. And they can see the person behind the patient, that we are all people first with hopes and dreams and jobs and fears and families who worry constantly about us. In other words, they can see that a patient isn't a disease with a body attached, but a life into which a disease has intruded. Most people, more people are surviving cancer with two thirds of cancer patients surviving five years past their diagnosis today, compared with just 47% in the mid 1980s. Therefore, understanding how patients transition to long term survivorship and manage the impact of cancer on their lives is critical. Blog narratives offer healthcare professionals a window into the cancer experience from diagnosis and beyond. In fact, cancer survivors' own narratives shed light on cancer's social impact and often in a manner that illustrates in a profound and evocative terms a lived experience of cancer. From my own experience and the research that I did, I found that a cancer diagnosis is not just a single event with a defined beginning and end, but it's an enduring condition. It's characterized by ongoing uncertainty, delayed or late effects of the disease or treatment, and concurrent psychosocial issues patients in a more holistic way. But is it possible that narrative can serve an even more important goal? Could it, in fact, improve patient services? Well, I believe that just as important as insights from the laboratory are, better understanding the experience of patients can provide a roadmap for the critical last mile of medical care. You know, the patients do have the best stories to learn with. So if you are a researcher, if you're a healthcare provider, if you're in any way connected to healthcare professionalism, 
in the words of Dr. Sharon, acknowledge these stories, absorb them, interpret them, and act on them. And if you're a patient, if you're a cancer survivor, find your place in the family of things. Find where you can tell your story, where your story is respected and it's, somebody bears witness to that story. And let's all come together and find a healing connection around our stories and a healing connection around the commonality of our, of our woundedness. So thank you very much.